Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Eric. And I think what we'll focus on is your work relating traditional meditation practices to their applications in modern medical and uh, psychological contexts. So perhaps you could begin by uh, outlining the current state of affairs. What techniques are being used? I know there are a lot of them. What techniques are most being used? And let's just go with that for now. Well, thanks so much, Richard, for the invitation to share some information, which is derived from our work, both at my private practice and from our research at San Francisco State and Teaching. So you're asking really which kind of meditative techniques, relaxation techniques, are integrated into the culture. Well, there are really multiple levels. In the academic side, I would say, or the more psychological side, and at the moment, mindfulness meditation in its many forms, whether compassion or others, or combined with cognitive behavior therapy, has taken the major foreground. So many hospitals, Many other areas are now using this technique, which was initially developed or really adapted from thousands of years old techniques by Jan Kabat-Zinn that was called mindfulness. It's a meditative practice. It, the concepts underlying that underlie almost all, I would say every meditative practice almost, and many other relaxation techniques. The second one would be, I think, for my own bias would be the awareness of breathing. This has also gotten into the foreground, especially the popular book by Nestor, uh, in which they, he explored the history and the application of breathing. We need to keep in mind that breathing is the mind-body connector. You know, we can breathe automatically. We don't have to think about it or we can change it. And every part of our being is connected to it. You know, whether you call it, and in many spiritual traditions, breathing is really the link, what we have talked about. If you think about that, whether that's prana, whether it's, you name it, it's there. Uh, Rua in, in Hebrew, it's always spirit, mind, spirit, mind, body, but really spiritus. Think of spiritus in Latin. It's also the bound between living and death. We stop breathing, we then transit. And so those are the two big ones, I think, that have taken over. So one to repeat is mindfulness meditation, all its, all its permutations. Mindfulness meditation has taken over, I think, in the public eye and the public world. And sometimes the experience one gets is to say, ah, this is it, this is new. This is the only way. And it's clear that, in fact, mindfulness meditation is, is based upon these thousands of years meditative practice, whether it's Buddhist, whether it's derived from Hindu practices. It makes no difference. And there are some common themes in those that means you, whatever tasks you're doing, you're present with it. You... You know, if your attention wanders, bring it back. And in behavior therapy, that's almost called global desensitization. You don't follow it. You desensitize to it. You take time out during the day. And the big thing that makes it either successful or not is that you need to practice and develop mastery. Uh, that same, the same concepts are true for teaching rest breathing patterns. If you, you know, think of all the techniques in pranayama or yoga. Here you breathe very easily and slowly. And then, you know, we can think of slightly earlier techniques that really hit the press in 1970 and the early 80s that would have been transcendental meditation. Again, he, a, a meditative technique which really embeds mindfulness just as much, but now you're also using a mantra. And the advantage of using a mantra is that it occupies your mind, so it's easier not to be distracted. And so there are many. Then there are many other techniques, but I think I've listed basically very quickly some of the most common ones. Mm -hmm. Let's take mindfulness meditation, and perhaps you could just say, you have said a little bit about it, but could you say specifically what mindfulness meditation is as a sitting practice? Basically, it's a sitting practice in which you sit, as I said, let me, what is mindfulness? Well, it was codified in the United States 
bij Jank heb het zin, wanneer je dit is, uh, at, uh, in Massachusetts, de medical school for patients. And people in that program, that met as a group, they practiced, they didn't just do mindfulness meditation, although they did, they also practiced movement or yoga practices, etc. And mindfulness meditation, really, what is this? Is you usually sit, you're quiet, and then you just observe your thoughts. Do not jump on that train with the thoughts and let them just go. And that process, I think, is not unique to mindfulness meditation as we know it. It's true to many techniques. If I think of the somatic techniques were developed in the United States by Edmund Jacobson, where he taught people to tighten their muscles and let them go sequentially. And it probably took almost 100 sessions to learn that skill implicit in that instruction. And people forget that, is that you focus or are aware of your muscle tension and how it felt let go. And if you're distracted from it, you brought it back, which is just like mindfulness. Or if you do autogenic training developed by Richard Schultz and Wolfgang Luthi in Germany, initially, it's really Schultz who developed that in the early uh, 19, 20, in the early part of the 20th century. It's a somatic technique, but really it's much more. Here you take a specific posture, you almost collapse for a moment, you let yourself be relaxed, and then you talk to your body part in a way, or you're with that body part. My right arm is heavy. And you sequentially learn to direct that kind of passive attention to your whole body. That is only step one. Again, implicit with that is that you're attending to that. If your attention wanders, bring it back. And then be able to describe whatever you experience just at that moment. Not because, not how it was to yesterday, but just at this moment. So that allows us want to learn a kind of I was going to use the word detachment, but that's the, that is negatively said. A sense of just being aware without having to compare to the future or, the, or really be only compare to the past. And so much of our anxieties in the world is because we're doing all this comparison. Ah, yesterday was worse or better versus I am just in the present. I look forward to the future. There is hope for me. And if I think of that, that concept is critical. I just did a poll with my students. I do this every semester. I ask a simple question on the first day of the semester. How did you feel this morning when you wake up? And basically, did you feel energized, happy, looking forward to the day? Or are you already exhausted, tired, and dreading the day like you're eyes on a treadmill? And I could ask, what do you think, what number of people, percentage of the students, we did more than 299 our data for, uh, answered that they are dreading the day? 55%. So this is the first day of the semester. When you, ideally, you want to wake up and okay, that's an exciting day. But remember, this is also a, a, students who may be economically more disadvantaged. So they often have to work and have other family responsibilities. To me, that is such sadness in the world that that occurs. Because really, if you're a young person in your early 20s, you know, you want to wake up. My God, there's something new. I'm happy. And that is not going on. So all these techniques, whether it's mindfulness techniques, and I put this in a category, not as mindfulness meditation, but that process is a way to train, in a way, the mind and thereby emotions so that I can just be present. And if I have that skill, then I become slightly less reactive as well. The, what makes the, all these techniques so different, I think, in our modern world, is that our attention span has shifted. Only 10 years ago, we could have, the average person attended to anything for about 150 seconds maximum, till a new distraction came up. So as we are talking to each other, as I'm talking with the audience or almost to the audience, as you're listening, within 10 to 15 years ago, you even if you were really interested, you, you would be distracted very quickly. If something came up, your attention distracted. Now, presently, it's 40 seconds. It's shocking. So, And I think that is quite, I would argue, almost harmful 
because we want to be able to stay present. And yet every 40 seconds, we are distracted. And the distractions aren't just outside of us, like the notifications on our cell phones or people coming by. They're the distractions now because we have been conditioned by our media to react all the time to the notifications that now we do it, we now do it ourselves. I'm sitting here and at that moment, I think of something else. I think of something else. That, and I think in time, from my perspective, that is harmful because depth, emotional depth, intellectual depth, depth of being occurs when you can be really present. And I make an analogy of a diving, of scuba diving. I don't know how many of you do ever done scuba diving, but if you do scuba diving, you go fairly deep. What happens is that you, you wear your gear, then you start going down, but you have to pause slowly to adapt to the depth. And then finally at the bottom, or the, let's say the, the floor of the ocean, which you explore, you're there. And then, then when you're running, when it's time to leave, then you slowly come up. And it takes time because you can't just pop to the surface because then you would have problems. You know. And that's what we normally do. And the time at the bottom, you could say, is where you are really present with somebody. You're really present with your work. You allow the brain emotions to work. But what are we doing now? We start diving into our work. And just as we're at the bottom, we pop up again to a notification. Now that takes time, then we have to take time to go down. So we are losing that in-depthness at times. And also every time we react, our bodies may be sympathetically activated. And I think this is one of the subtle cofactors that may lead to chronic inflammation. It's a kind of funny way to think about. It. For example, if I react to a loud clap, for that moment, unknowingly, I may jump. Remember, every thought, every emotion has a corresponding body activity. And so if I react, Mentally, my body reacts. When I give this alarm reaction, my digestion may slow down for a moment. If I'm too stressed and I keep that being stressed all the time, then it's more difficult for our body to regenerate. And so you can see all the benefits in, in the opposite side by mastering techniques such as, and I want to put it such as mindfulness meditation, it's very permutations. And at the same time, I am not persuaded, and the research is fairly clear on that, that mindfulness meditation may be no better than progressive relaxation, transcendental meditation, any type of med meditation. You know, I think of the Theosophical Society, where you, we, all, we all practice often meditation, or when we get together, we practice first. Those techniques, I, for my bias, have the same efficacy. The only distinction is that those techniques are not always studied. And so we forget that they are beneficial. The benefits are the same. The category of sameness in that same way is when you do very slow breathing, about six breaths a minute. And you do this effortlessly. So when you exhale, your lower abdomen slightly comes in without almost awareness. And then you when you inhale, you allow the abdomen to widen. It's a very peaceful way of breathing. But then you are present within yourself. And as you exhale, you may almost feel the air flowing inside, going down your arms and legs. It's a mindfulness meditation. There are two pieces about, about mindfulness meditation, even yoga practices, that we always think they're useful and always think there are no side effects. It works out that for about 80% of people, the data is ambiguous. It's really, it can be very beneficial for maybe up to 20%. They may have problems. It may lead to some difficulty. And let me give two concepts. One, if I have been emotionally traumatized, I hold my body tight and now I sit quietly and I relax a bit, then maybe all of a sudden I'm overwhelmed with those feelings that could occur, those memories. And that could be very difficult. I think in many ways that's very useful. And healing, it could be healing, it can be too difficult. Two, some of these techniques don't work well when you really are angry, pissed off. 
we're frustrated because our bodies are totally ready to fight flight. And then when you try to sit there, your brain just keeps saying, ah, what about that SOB? What about, ah, ah, ah. you know, we do this. Or in the car, we do that. You know, somebody cuts in front of us. And then we just, ah. you know, and it's also even start pressing our gas pedal more, get right next to the guy or get in front of him. Whatever we do, we compete. Hopefully we don't do that. Hopefully we have learned such control that we can say, ah, I look at me, there I go, go again. Is that necessary? I am not yet that skilled. <laughs> However, if you take it from a physiological perspective, an evolutionary perspective, then I would argue the following. When you get really frustrated or angry, at that moment, and that can be in relationships, it can be, you know, you be arguing with somebody and yell at each other, or we start to argue and then we escalate more and more. There are a couple of tips you can do. One, don't even try to argue more. All that will is escalate. Do something called time out, like you do with little kids. Time out means the moment you get too upset, then you're captured by your amygdala, basically. You're just only are going to react in a defense. And we all do that at times. At that moment, if you're aware of that, at that literally walk away, take time out. And if, then once you take time out, then do some physical activity, intense physical activity to complete the alarm reaction. Think about this. This is the, our bodies now react in defense. It's like it saw a saber toothed tiger, which is now your partner, your supervisor, or the person driving a car. It makes no difference. And I react and I react with fight and flight. In our culture, I do not recommend fighting, by the way. Because all we then do is we say these nasty things. Remember in a relationship, I'm sure most of us have done that. We start talking, we get so angry. And then all of a sudden we say something really nasty, like a knife going into that person. It makes sense from the evolutionary perspective because I'm going to find something by which I can kill that person. And now we use language. And then when those words leave our mouth, we we recognize it and it's almost too late. And those are those statements are almost unrecoverable. They are really are very challenging. But by, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes really good sense why we do that. Because now we have forgotten about the future. We're de dealing only with immediacy of survival. What I want to do, what one can learn, and I would recommend that, especially to couples and families, is when your threshold gets too high, when you get too high, make an agreement, time out. Leave. That doesn't mean you don't solve the problem. That's the key. It means you take time out. Now you do exercise. You know, there are many practices you can do, but do something very intensively. If you find you have no hip and knee problems, then run up and down the stairs till your thighs really hurt. And you keep focusing on that. Keep doing that or something else. And you can do this even in the bathroom because if you're in a work setting, the only excuse you always have to leave a meeting for a moment. I'm sorry, I need to go to the bathroom. I had too much coffee today. And then do it in the bathroom. You know, squat, do sense squatting or something like that. Or if you're a skier or the ski position called this a sit position where you lean your you sit against the back and your knees are at 90 degrees. So you're like a chair position of your body against the wall. Sit there for a while. I can promise you, if you do that, your brain gets captured by your thighs. Nothing else will do it. Once that is, once the alarm reaction has been completed, then go back. Then do mind. Then do meditation practices. Yeah. And I think we have underestimated the power how much our bodies affect our brain. And if we can first quiet the body it's much easier to do any meditation practice. And so I would recommend for many people, before they meditate, if they have any agitation or they were in traffic the whole time, don't just meditate for that moment. Complete the alarm reaction. Do some physical exercise. And many people who have done physical exercise know that after they've done intensive physical exercise, they're somehow more mellow. And I always told my students, if you are going to want to talk to me about something very difficult where I could get upset, 
Let me go jogging first. <laughs> then thereafter, I won't be reactive. And so this is, so that's a kind of hopefully a useful rule to think about. Let's look at the other side of attention. Um, obviously, attention is a central theme of these meditative practices. And we can go a little bit into that. But let's look at the other side of attention. Um, you've correctly pointed out, I think, that uh, our society is collectively suffering from attention deficit disorder. But in certain instances, there's also absorption of attention. And I'm thinking particularly of kids playing video games, where actually there's no distraction or no visible distraction. Um, there's complete absorption, what I believe the uh, yogis call dharana. You know, you're just totally absorbed in whatever it is you're doing. Um, how does that relate to some of the things you've just been saying? To me, I look at attention from two different ways. One is attention which I direct from the inside, and the other is attention that's being captured by the outside. So when I think about it, to be successful in the world, from my bias, by the way, <laughs> or a student, what I need to be able to do is even focus my attention on material that has traditionally been boring. I need to be able to hold my focus. I need to direct my own eyes to the text. What makes video games so different and much of our media so different is that it doesn't do that. The signal outside is a vigilance signal. It triggers the vigilance. So in a way, and that's what all the quick moving signals are on the screen as well, or with sound. Every time a loud noise occurs, I orient. Every time I, something occurs on the screen, I orient. And so I react to the stimuli on the outside, which then I, I'm absorbed by that, but it doesn't train me on the inside. And to me, that process had not been explained well. The best one I can think of who focuses on that kind of concept or the potential long-term harm has been Joseph Pierce. And he, in, you know, in the 1970s, I think, wrote a book called Evolution's End. Uh, and, you know, that looks at that part, the potential harm of that kind of process, these processes. And I think to me, when I look at that, that is the harm of digital displays, of all these fast signals. It does not allow ourselves to regenerate as much. And every time, instead of me directing the attention, the outside world captures my attention. And I want to teach people how they can direct their own attention so they have a choice to attend or not. And that is a very difficult choice. Ideally, what meditation does, it teaches you to make that self-focus of attention. It's different to be absorbed in meditation, which people can be and often are. And whether you use the word one, 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 or a mantra, o matni patni om, or whatever one may do, or one just sits quietly, but it's self-generative. There's no outside signal that is capturing you and evoking it. So think of the difference. When I'm a hunter and gatherer, I walk along the safari, and in the periphery, I see something shimmering or something that could be a dangerous animal, or it could be food, but I have to orient to it. I don't have to, but basically I'm orienting. That's totally different than me planning my route where I'm going to go. And I want to take that option of planning the route. I want to go somewhere and I want to, we are all part of a system, but we want to have a self-autonomy embedded within the community and not have the signals outside only driving us. Very, very good. That's very helpful. Well, mindfulness seems to be derived from the Buddhist practice of Vipassana, which is often Thank translated you. as mindfulness. Uh, but the Buddhists 
generally, as I understand it, focus on two different dimensions of meditation. One is vipassana, which is uh, insight is another term. And the other side is shamatha, which is calmness. Uh, the emphasis is not only clarity, but on calmness. Uh, how does uh, the mindful practices that you're discussing here manage to balance those two uh, dimensions? I think the mindfulness part would evoke often calmness because I learned not to react. So I think it is probably embedded in that. The biggest difference is translating the concepts into your daily life. So just because I sit for 20 minutes, yes, I can sharpen my brain. The much more challenging part is to carry that out when you see your supervisor and then they start, you get frustrated to take that other wide, that calmness, what you would say, realize that person is there, you know, and not take it personally. That takes lots of training. And people vary. Some people are very reactive. They need much more training. Some people are intrinsically less reactive that way. I think the key of meditational practices is not just doing the meditation. It's great to do it in the morning, great to do it in the evening. And we have observed with our students, not doing the meditation, but doing progressive relaxation in a meditative style. So I put it that when they do it in the morning, as if it sets their day and they are more calm during the day. However, those are also the people who have enough time to take 20 minutes in the morning. And if you have 20 minutes in the morning, you can probably be calmer during the day. On the other hand, when people do it before going to sleep, the majority would then experience that their sleep is better, whatever better means. And that makes sense because often we worry you know, about things. We get stimulated by looking at our cell phone, planning the next meeting, whatever it is, or have watching this horrendous news about wars or murders on television or streaming on our digital displays, whatever. And so we're agitated. And therefore, we're doing meditation, prayer. I can make no difference between any of those for that part. But by or reading inspirational texts and not murder mysteries, <laughs> but really cl almost classical ones that, that may want to support the development of, a, of almost a higher being and calmness. And I do that before going to sleep then my brain is quieter and then sleep is easier to come to. And that includes not only the text, it includes the lighting environment that before going to sleep, the lights become more or reddish. You have less intensity. So you get the body ready for sleep. But in the morning, when you wake up, you can do the practice and then be outside, look at the sunrise and get the light stimulation in your eyes to really wake up. Of course, all of these practices, as described now, are essentially cerebral. And that is, they have to do the mind and the attention of the mind. Now, one obvious difference between these practices and many religious practices is that religious practices also incorporate a strong element of devotion. That is to say, emotional engagement. And many of those traditions will say that is the most important part of the meditation. Um, and here, the, the, the term detachment does actually seem to apply. So uh, how do you integrate the emotional element into the meditative practices that you're talking about? No, I think you can do it. I think to, to be healthy, you want to have strong, you want to have emotion. So I am not saying don't be, don't have strong emotions. The key is to have very strong emotions for love, caring, tenderness. And then we also have very strong emotions of anger, resentment. And when they are taken over, then we are difficult. Those are the ones I think you really want to master, I mean, to reduce. And sometimes we can't quite reduce them, but by in the meditational part, maybe you can step back to the outside. But I remember taking, practicing with Tarfan Tulku in Tibetan, Tibetan meditation, and having strong emotions is a very powerful way to grow. So, you know, you can do an emotion of love or tenderness and evoke that feeling. If you have a strong feeling, then you act, but you have to act on it also. 
So I don't have a good answer for it, by the way. I'm sorry. It's a great question. I never thought of that. I often see, I mean, I think the biggest piece, which I think we did not deal with, is the usefulness of groups, support groups. And that's where emotions also come in because I develop a kind of fellowship. You know, I remember going to the healing camps with Dora Coons at Indralaya or or the one up in New York, or even at uh, the Theosophical Headquarters, you know, and when you do something in a group, it's so much easier. Satsang. It is so much easier to be together because, you know, by yourself, it's very hard to mobilize yourself sometimes to get up, to do it. But by a group, you have this kind of almost peer pressure initially, but it's really, but uh, but it's not, I don't mean it negatively at all. It's really very helpful. And also, I think from if we take ourselves as an energetic being, you know, then we are contagious with each other. And so if we, if we are with the present, that's the advantage of having a mentor, a teacher present who is very experienced because they're, I would almost say, they're, they're personal quality in the meditational state resonates, evokes that resonation in us. And it's often easier than to do it. And then finally, we have the opportunity to share. And we live in a world where we're so socially isolated, so many. And we know that social support, social connectiveness is one of the better predictors for health. But remember, we don't meditate really for health. <laughs> you, we, if I take the Buddhist perspective, you meditate because you want every sensate being to grow and you don't just try to keep the powers for yourself. And I think that's a critical part. So I do see that in the meditational part that ideally we have a responsibility to the community as well. That part is sometimes forgotten. I sometimes really... You know, how can you share what you have and help someone else? And that is in that is really what compassion means. And there's a great exercise, you know, which one can do uh, by just saying, okay, every day I'm going to do something nice for someone else. And you don't care whether they, you know, it's almost like when you drive the car and you pay your toll. Now it doesn't work anymore because they're all automatic machines. But in the past, you could drive your car. There was a toll taker there. And you would give the person another $2 for the toll and say, that's for the person free. You know, those are fun things to do. You can smile and do that. But I think if, if we did that more, then we, not gen we generalize the concepts underlying mindfulness and meditation. I want to make one more different point that we tend to think of mindfulness or meditation usually as a quality where I sit peacefully, whether cross legged or however I'm sitting on a chair, depending how old you are, or in the church, it may or temple, it makes a difference where you are, or under a tree, which I love because I can lean against the tree and be part of it. However, for many people, movement meditations are much more effective to quiet the mind. In my limited experience, for most people, if you do sl a slow Zen walk, for example, where you walk so slowly, you feel each joint move, you feel the air brushing against you, and you may walk 10 feet in 10 minutes. And you're, the those are quicker ways to quiet the body and to really be mindful. So we, And we have tended to underestimate the power of that. And I think the reason is that we live in a culture where we can present material in a group. We're trained in classrooms, traditionally, where movement is not supported. <laughs> we sit on chairs, so it's very easy. Yet it's clear, movement. And then, you know, they can, there's a big range by self-organizing movements where you take a walk slowly, you look outside, don't go too fast, look at all the trees, look at all the, the different green shapes and look upward because when you look upward, you'll probably start feeling better automatically. You know, so that's one. You can do very structured movement meditations in groups, but it's not done as often as I think. It's our day, we have done research not that way, but we've done research just having people walk in two different styles. 
And for one minute, you just walk slouch looking down. You know how the cell phone look, you look down, just walk very slowly looking down in a slump position. And the other, you sort of skip and look up. And you alternate these so they're well published. You know, good, it's a good scientific study, crossover design, etc. And what you then see when people report how they feel, when they walk in a slump position, looking down, their energy drops, they have more access to hopeless, helpless thoughts. When they skip and look up, they feel the energy goes up significantly and they have more access to optimistic, empowering thoughts. So I think when you're doing meditational practices, when you're doing movement, always end with so far almost like, so like skipping like a child, but especially looking upward. And many traditions have looking upward at the sky at some level. And I think biologically looking upward means I become more open, not defensive. And if I slouch, which is different than sitting in meditation when you sit erect, but when I slouch, look down, that tends to be the defense position, which accesses more hopelessness, often for people. What was most interesting in our study, that when we looked at, we had the students, we have like 200 students or so, we did this. We've done it with thousands of people, literally. The effect is quite good. That when people had a past history of depression, those who walked in this slouch mode got much more, their energy dropped much more than those who didn't have a history of depression. But yet, with everybody who skipped, the all their energies went up. That was the same. So if you tend to have a tendency to be more depressed, I would highly recommend when you do meditation, do movement meditation, and look up. Look at the roofs of the top. Describe the tops of the trees. And in your house, Take your symbol you're looking at, whether it's a statue of Buddha, whether it's something else or Christ, it makes no difference what it is for me, but put it above the, you know, the eyebrow level. So you have to look up. And when you do that, you're slightly more light, you're more likely to feel inspired. My uh, next question has two parts. One is what kind of long-term efforts, effects, have these meditations had uh, as measured by studies? And two, have there been any studies that generally compare the long-term effects from non-religious meditators uh, to those who meditate long-term in a religious context? Let me make an attempt at, at both of those. I won't do it completely. Okay. There are a number of studies that su suggest and support that meditative practices, I'm not defining them for a moment, have health benefits. That means less anxiety, lower heart disease, lower hypertension, you may even live longer. This, and you know, that's a very, you know, you, and it makes sense from a physiological perspective because you're probably reducing the inflammatory response. You're developing in the meditational state, a more parasympathetic state, which allows the body to regenerate. I think that I can, at the same time, to keep in mind that health includes doing some vigorous daily activity all the time. It means eating for my bias, an organic food diet with no, you know, and not the American simple carbohydrate diet. And so I'm not going to make comments on that. Yes, the data is quite good on that. Uh, however, to say that one technique is better than the other, I think from my bias, as I understand the literature, no one has ever shown that. The early data where there's a lot of evidence that there are benefits was transcendental meditation because that has been going on. When they follow these participants, they, their health status is better. The data is, there's no way, that's what it says. The similar implications are when people practice mindfulness meditation, they benefit. Probably, I would argue the same, but I would not say that one is better than the other at all. Now, the, and so I think any and any meditational practice, spiritual practice, by which you get centered, and I would recommend 
the ones where you can do this even before meals for a moment and then the family or the group can eat together is even more beneficial because you get centered that is now lost in the American culture. And there's a distinction doing a prayer like a mechanical technique. Oh, shit. I mean, versus be, which is not what, what meditation is, but prayer can be both intentional like a meditation or can be mechanical. We're talking more about intentional practice. Those all seemingly have significant benefits, including for doing diet, for possibly even weight loss, to anxieties, to even uh, dealing with cancer, discomfort, and pains. And then finally, the question which you're asking is a much more difficult question between groups that have a, you know, a training in you know, spiritual traditions or not, in that sense. Then we can say that, ah, the Seventh-day Adventists, which is a religious kind of structure, the Mormons, which are, you know, they as a group live significantly longer. They have lower cancer rates. However, is it due because of the their spiritual practices? Is it due because they may not smoke? Is it due because they have social support? We don't know that. We do know in, in small lung cancer cells that those people who have a spiritual belief tend to live significantly longer than those who don't. Very so I think, and maybe it is if I have a spiritual, I can argue that if I have a kind of spiritual belief or knowingness, maybe I'm less anxious. And anxiety would inhibit healing, possibly. I'm making a hypothesis never tested or, you know, there's no data for. Well, so this brings up this brings oh. up some interesting points in that, um, you know, you could almost go back to William James's pragmatism, whereas, you know, since if I don't know uh, whether God exists or not, it's healthier for me to believe that God exists than if not. So even if I don't know, uh, I might as well do it from a pragmatic point of view. And yeah. um, I rather doubt that many people go very far with that, but uh, you're your thoughts suggest that uh, to some degree. Um, well, another issue is how widespread do you find meditative practices in general among the population? It has distinctly grown over time. And many, I can only say that many hospitals now or medical settings offer some versions, often of mindfulness meditation, or stress management programs, which are almost always covered in most medical uh, hospital settings for patients. So that would indicate it's quite, it's very widespread. Do people actually practice it all? <laughs> well, that, you know, that is a different question. Uh, for that, I don't know, but we do know that what used to be called alternative, complementary and alternative medicine, which you could say some of these techniques used to fall under as well, that they have a significantly spread in the world and people spend more money out of pocket for those techniques than they do out of pocket for medical care almost. So it's very interesting. So there's a, it's a big business in that sense. How wide is it spread? I don't think, well, let me say it differently. How wide is it spread? The distinction I think is that there's no, at least in the culture I live in, and that's the San Francisco Bay Area, which is different maybe than living in Texas or other places uh, in this more liberal world, I would say. Uh, meditation is totally accepted. And 40 years ago or 30 years ago, people may have looked askance at you a bit. Now, when I ask my students, all know about it, doesn't mean they practice it, uh, but they, and they don't judge it negatively. So it has a positive uh, valence. And I think if you, you know, there's no way not to, let's say it that way. You go to the internet, you go to, whether you do Google searches, anywhere you go, all magazines, they all, many have articles about meditational practices. And so I think of the techniques that has been in medicine or psychology, for example, mindfulness meditation, meditation in its varied forms has been the major accepted technique in behavioral medicine 
And that's really big. I would argue that breathing techniques or heart rate variability training is equally, if maybe not more effective, because they also teach you to change your physiology at the same time, as well as mindfulness. And I think those are more powerful, especially to start with, that uh, those are also accepted, but not as well known yet. And yet I see them going in, in a really upward slope. And I would recommend that for everyone. Very good. Well, this has been very helpful. We're coming to the end of our time. And I'm just wondering if you have any other points that you'd like to cover that we uh, haven't already discussed. I think the major point is if you want to practice whatever technique you're doing, whether it's mindfulness meditation, whether it's prayer, whether it's relaxation techniques, etc., it's easier to do it in a group. That's one. Two, practice, practice, practice but not mindless practice. It's practice with a pa gentle, passive intent. And then do an experiment with yourself. Give yourself a 30-day challenge. For 30 days, do it twice a day. And then see if, there are any, if you notice anything. You know, it won't be a very big one. Ask your family members. You can even do an experiment. Do it every morning before going to work. And then see... Ask your co-workers after a month. Hey, have you noticed anything about me? You know, we need feedback. We need small changes. That is why I love doing using the work of biofeedback or breathing retraining, which we do with an app now called FlowMD, and which you use the app in front of you, and it shows you how you're breathing or how your heart rate is. It's really mindfulness training in many ways, but you can see that you benefit. And we'd love to have immediacy of feedback mindfulness training that's some or meditation that is sometimes difficult because we sit and we struggle initially the other part is which i learned from autogenic training which i still teach at san francisco state maybe start shorter episodes initially start with five minutes then as your, your brain gets trained go to six minutes and seven minutes 30 minutes may just be too long in the first day and what i said earlier when you feel emotionally agitated, first do physical activity and then sit. And, if, and be sure that you don't do it when you're very hungry or overstuffed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all very helpful. And this has been um, extremely informative uh, and insightful. So I want to thank you. I think we can close here, but um, I very much appreciate your time. And uh, I'm sure our viewers will find it very uh, informative and uh, helpful. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share these practices or some knowledge about these practices. And I continue to be impressed by the mission of the Theosophical Society and also the work at the camps. Thank you so much.